Good evening, Bible Way. We welcome you to our uh, broadcast uh, this week for prayer meeting. We thank the Lord for the privilege, for the technology that he's given us to be able to get the word out even in these times when we're sheltering in place and trying to do what we can to make sure that the virus doesn't spread any worse than it already has. We appreciate you so very much. Appreciate your prayers. It's a joy to my heart to have Brother Steve Lyons with us tonight. And Brother Steve will be bringing the message after a while. We've got some uh, wonderful young ladies here to sing tonight. And uh, that's going to be a blessing as well. I want to give you some prayer requests. Just before I do, I want to read a passage of Scripture from the Word of God. In the book of James, chapter 5, and verse number 16, the Bible said, Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. He prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. I thank God that we have prayer meetings still at Bible Way and that we believe there's a God in heaven that hears and answers prayer. I want to give you some requests tonight. Then it's a blessing to have Brother Gerald Rose with us. He's going to come and lead us in prayer in just a few moments. Let's remember a little girl by the name of Samantha. Uh, she's five months old, and um, this little baby girl is at Vanderbilt, and she's going to be looking at heart surgery here in a few weeks. Please remember Samantha. Uh, Sister Mandy Hagee went back to the doctor this week, and, and uh, we need to pray for her. She's doing okay. Please remember her in prayer. Uh, always remember, Brother Brian, I hope and pray that you've had the privilege and the joy to go and hear his Sunday school lessons. Brother Brian's doing a great job with the Sunday school lesson, and, and uh, we're, just, uh, we're thankful uh, that he's willing to do that and able to do that. Uh, I hate to tell him this, but he actually looks better on camera than he does in person, I believe. Amen. Maybe, maybe Miss Kim's putting some makeup on him or something like that. I don't know. But he is a blessing to us, and I know he will be to you as he teaches the Word of God. Sister Margaret Ketrin, she's been this week for an MRI and um, on her back, and she's having some tremendous problems in her spine. Please remember Sister Margaret and Brother Zeke. Uh, they both need our prayers. Uh, please remember Brother Larry Hilton in your prayers. Sister Rhonda Tiller. Uh, Sister Ruth Johnson. Sister Ruth called me last week and left a message on my phone. And I, she is just one sweet lady. She appreciated the, 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 the CDs and the folks that are getting the DVDs. They just appreciate it so much. And such a sweet, sweet lady. Uh, let's remember Sister Ruth in prayer. Uh, remember our country. I'd like to remember our missionaries tonight in prayer our health care workers and our first responders, please remember them. Let's pray one for another. Uh, pray for the elderly and the shut-in, those who are in the nursing homes, those who are incarcerated, the ministry of the Salvation Army, let's remember them. And then last week I was asked to pray. I actually had a phone call last week from uh, Brian Montoya. He called and talked to me for about five minutes, and and uh, they're missing church, Brother Steve, and... Uh, We've got a great bunch of kids around here, um, and uh, e even when they're teenagers, I call them kids. I'm 60 years old now. I guess I can do that, but uh, just a great bunch of young people, and we thank the Lord for them, and uh, they desire that we pray for them during this time. It's an unusual, an unusual time, and um, let me just remind you of this, uh, that God does hear and answer prayer. And uh, let's pray for the leaders of our nation. Pray for our governor. Uh, they're making decisions that are going to affect lives. And uh, just pray that God will give each one of them wisdom. Brother Rose, if you would, you come on and uh, lead us in prayer. Then we'll have some announcements. The ladies are going to sing. And Brother Steve will come with the message tonight. God bless you. And thank you for being with us here in the service. Let's pray this morning.
Father, we do thank you for another day of life. We thank you that we come in Jesus' name, that name that's above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and every tongue will confess your Lord. Yes. And Lord, we thank you today for being able to come and hear the preaching of the word of God. Lord, it doesn't hurt any of us to hear that. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. And Lord, that those of us that are here, we don't have this virus. And Lord, I'm thankful for that. And Lord, I just ask you today, God, would you, Lord, be in our hearts. Lord, today, God, help us to soak in the word of God. That's the only thing that's going to keep us going. And Lord, we thank you for our pastor, for Brother Steve Lyons that's going to be bringing the message for tonight. And Lord, we ask you today now to have your will and way in our lives. And Lord, we'll not forget to give you the honor, the glory, and the praise for all that you do, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Brother Rose. Appreciate that so very much. Brother Rose, I know, has prayed, he and his wife, Miss Barbara was here with us. I know they prayed many times for this pastor and uh, pray for different ones in the church, and we're thankful to have praying friends in the ministry. We're going to give you a few announcements now. We'll pull the slides up this morning and let uh, share those with you. I hope they'll be a blessing. Verse of Scripture, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Psalms 31, verse 19. It's good to trust the Lord in these days. The Bible said thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. That's a blessing. Uh, please do follow the guidelines. Uh, I've been out a little bit last week, uh, more so than in the weeks prior. Tried to wear a mask when I went into a pub public place. Tried to take good care of my hands uh, and uh, I, I've said I've washed my hands I guess more in the last month than I have in my life but anyway it, that's what it takes to try to stay away from this virus so maintain the six feet do what you can uh, let me ask you to spread the word about the um, the videos uh, they're 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 up there and uh, through social media maybe uh, text message email if uh, you think there's somebody that could benefit, uh, please uh, spread the word. You just go to BibleWayOnline.net, click on videos, and then uh, you can share that link with anybody uh, that you'd like to. Let me encourage you to do that. Also, we have the CDs and the DVDs available. Uh, we just need to know. Uh, please let us know if, uh, if you need a DVD or a CD. Thank you. Thank you, thank you to our first responders, uh, health care workers, essential services, the military, uh, the transportation, the faithful caregivers. Uh, we can't thank these people enough. They're actually putting their life on the line every day, and I'm so grateful for them. Call if you need us, uh, if you need groceries, uh, something done around your house, medicine, automobile, uh, please uh, let us know. Uh, we may not uh, be able to do the mechanic work, but I bet you we know somebody that can, and we'll get it done for you, uh, the Lord willing. Shelter in place, Brother Steve's done a great job with this. There's a selfie in place. Uh, I'm a little bit partial to this picture. Uh, these are my grandchildren. These are the least four of our 11 grandchildren. That one on the left over there is little Ava. And uh, we told them to put their hands over their head, and she's covered her head up like she's got a headache. I guess she didn't want to listen to Papa. But anyway, I uh, appreciate the kids. I love them. Here we go. We got some pictures that were sent in. Luke and Braley Deck Repair Company. And uh, Luke, I believe you can tighten that up a little better than that, son. Amen. And uh, we appreciate them. Appreciate Sawyer with his big fish. Uh, he caught a big trout. Papa ate that trout yesterday. It was good too, amen. And these are some of our children that come in on the van. We love them, love them dearly, uh, pray for them, and we look forward to getting them back to the house of God. Uh, uh, this one right here, 
somebody needs to send this to Governor Lee and uh, help him to understand that barber shops are an essential uh, business. Amen. It's essential that we get Brother Ralph a haircut and some black dye for his mustache. <laughs> All right, the girls are going to sing. God bless you, girls. When they're finished singing, Brother Steve's going to come uh, with the lesson tonight from God's Word. And when I say this morning, I would want to explain uh, by the comments from Brother Rose and myself, we're actually recording this on Sunday morning for playback on uh, Wednesday. And uh, the reason for that is, is it's not only efficient, but it gives us a longer time, you know, between the, the cycle when we're here. Uh, we do try to practice uh, social distancing. We're very, try to be very careful when we're here and 
and uh, we thank the Lord for what's done. Uh, these ladies that came this morning, I uh, spent several hours here, uh, Brother Jim and, and uh, Brother Richard, uh, they, they, they get here, you know, at 8 a.m. or before, and then, and then they're basically here till about noon. Uh, so, uh, you know, we just thank the Lord for uh, those who are willing to do. Now, I'll ask you to turn in your Bibles to the book of uh, 2 Timothy. And uh, we're going to look at some gifts of God uh, in, the, uh, in the message. And, and I want us to think about the, the setting for 2 Timothy. Now, it's a pastoral epistle. We, we generally look at that. And, and uh, Paul was uh, turning to his uh, son in Christ, his uh, protege, as it were, Timothy. Timothy was following the Lord. He was doing uh, the things that God would have him to do. And, and uh, Paul was writing this letter not only of encouragement, but of instruction. And uh, uh, we begin to look at this setting. Uh, this is probably, Paul's been preaching 30 years, more or less. He's fought a lot of battles. He has a tremendous amount of experience. Uh, God has used him mightily. And uh, like we all do, he's trying to mentor. He's trying to help Timothy to become the best version of him uh, that he could be as he serves God. And I want us to look just at one verse initially, uh, which is uh, from the book of uh, 2 Timothy, the first chapter, the seventh verse. And uh, Paul wrote this to Timothy. He said, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And when we begin to look at that in the context, uh, the words immediately preceding this, uh, Paul was encouraging Timothy, he was talking about the faith uh, that uh, Paul had uh, seen in, in, in Timothy's uh, family, uh, in his grandmother Lois, in his mother Eunice. In verse 6 of this, uh, Paul said, uh, I, I, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. And then he goes on to talk about these gifts. Now when we begin to think about Timothy, Timothy was uh, following the Lord. He was in the path that he should go. And, and Paul was trying to encourage him of, of, of embracing those things that God had given him and understanding what God wanted to do in his life. And, and we see this aspect in verse 6 of the gift of God. And I would tell you that in each one of our lives, God has given us great gifts. I appreciate the ladies that were singing this morning. Uh, Laura plays and, and sings so beautifully and so much talent that's here. God has given them that gift I appreciate Pastor Vinoy as, as he leads the church and uh, in these difficult, most unusual circumstances. That is the gift of God. I appreciate uh, Richard and Jim and, and all the things they do. Uh, uh, and Brother Brian has figured out how to uh, uh, record the Sunday school lesson and post that. Those things are a gift of God. The greatest gift that God has ever given to any one of us is eternal life. The forgiveness of sins through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm so glad that he didn't stop there that he gave us the things that we needed to, to make the body of Christ exactly what it should be. And Paul was encouraging Timothy to think about these gifts in his life. And, and he goes on in verse 7, and he talks about one thing that God did not give us. And when I say us, this is definitely a message towards the Christian, uh, towards the born-again uh, believer in Christ. Uh, and, and, and when he talks about this, there's one thing that here that he did not give us and three things that he did. So I want us to look at that uh, this evening. Now, Paul starts off here, he says that, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear. And when we begin to think about the world that we're living in today, there is a tremendous amount of fear. If we were truly to do an honest survey, we would say that most people are afraid of something. Uh, I know in my family, I've got people that are afraid of spiders. It doesn't matter how small the spider is. Uh, you know, if there's a spider around, it's a problem. And uh, the, the spider usually pays with his life to address that situation. Uh, but most of us today are afraid of something. We hear people talking about the economy and it failed and it's coming back. And, and, and I tell you, I sit there and watched, uh, I think it was last week, 2,000 job losses in this area in one day that were announced. And people are starting to say, how will I pay for things? And, 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 and what will I do? And when the furlough is over, will I go back to my job? Other people are saying, you know, I'm in this demographic that they've identified where I'm more susceptible to, uh, to you know, to, to uh, uh, fatality from this uh, COVID-19 virus. And, uh, you, you know, if I get this thing, uh, am I going to make it or not? Uh, and, and, and we understand that fear is something, you know, concern, what have you, something that's in the world around us today. But I want us to think about this spirit of fear. Paul said that God hath not given us, God has not given us the spirit of fear. 
And when you begin to think about what this means, the, uh, the definition of fear is it's a particular way, it's a pattern of feeling and thinking and uh, believing in things. And I'm going to tell you today that God has not called us to be the church of failure. He's called us to be the church of the living God, uh, the, the church of the uh, victorious, as it were. And God has not given us this position in life where we're allowed or permitted or encouraged or, or uh, in any way uh, permitted to, to, uh, to permeate this fear factor in our life. Yes, there are things that are going to keep us up at night. Uh, I wish that those things were always uh, good things on the spiritual side. Uh, the, the pastor spoke this morning as he was giving the announcements uh, uh, previously about uh, people within our church uh, that have never come to accept Christ as their Savior and the prayer that we have that, that goes on for them. And, and Brother Wayne's uh, uh, not here, but uh, you know his ministry uh, with, the, uh, with the prison system, praying for those men that their life will be right not only with Christ but with society when they're released. Yes, there are things that ought to keep us up at night uh, uh, concerned about them, but it not, ought not to be that the Christian's life is overcome by fear. Uh, think about the great things that God has done in my life. And, uh, and you forgive me, I know myself better than anybody does, except for God. He knows me better than I know myself. But I think about the, the times in my life when I have wondered, is there going to be a way out, as it were? Now, this is a, uh, you know, this is a secular statistic, but they talk about the fact that 80 to 90 percent of the things that we really wring our hands and we fret over and we worry about, 80 to 90 percent of those things never actually happen. It's only a fraction of the things that we really are concerned about which become a problem for us in life. As I was doing my, my study, my research for the, uh, for the lesson, I, I, I ran across a statement that said, uh, it was, a, it was a, a writer who said, if you really want to test your memory to see how good, it, how good it is, think about what you were worried about one year ago. That was a good thought, right? What is it that kept you up a year ago? Did it happen? Probably 80, 90% of the time it didn't. But the problem with fear when Paul said uh, to, to young Timothy, in verse 6, uh, it, well, the verses, uh, first five verses, he talks about this, this great heritage that he has and, and the love of God and, and what's been manifest in his life. And in, in verse 6, uh, uh, Paul says, Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance uh, that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee. The issue with fear is fear changes us. Whether it's, uh, uh, whether it's intentional, whether it's subconscious, but fear will change your behavior. Fear will cause you to do things that you wouldn't normally do, and fear will keep you from doing the things that you normally should do uh, and prevent you from doing those. It will delay you. Fear has an element of torment to it, and God did not give us that presence. I think about what are we fearful of today? We think about the things that Paul faced in his day. Uh, certainly in his time there was pestilence and, and there was poverty and there was illness and, and what have you. And, and we still face those uh, you know, difficult situations in the world around us today. We, we think about the things that, that are, are, are common in the world around us today and, and common in the day of, of Paul's time. And I think about the fact that I believe that the church today is often afraid to witness, to be uh, seen visibly uh, as the body of Christ because of the rejection that we saw Paul face and, and uh, John faced and John the Baptist faced and, and Peter faced and, and certainly Jesus was rejected for the preaching of the gospel message that he was the son of God, that he came born of a virgin, that through his blood we could have the forgiveness of sins. There was rejection in that. And I think sometimes this spirit of fear gets into our life that says if people recognize you for who you are, for what it is that, that you stand up for, for aligning with the word of God, for being a part of the, of the church that still believes in the, uh, in the completeness and, and the trueness of the word of God, that uh, there is a heaven, there is a hell on the other side of this life. There will be a judgment that Jesus is going to come again in, in what we call the rapture of the church and, and take his people home. I think there's a spirit of fear that says that we could be ridiculed. We could be called out because of those stances, those positions, those, those things aligned with the word of God that, quite frankly, most of the world does not agree with. We think about the, the grief that, we could be, that could be brought upon us by the acceptance of the word of God. And when we begin to think about things that we're afraid of, 
I want you to think about the words that were written by the prophet Isaiah in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah when he was talking about the grief, the pain, the torment, the punishment that Christ him brought willingly upon himself that we might go free from those things. I think sometimes the spirit of fear is we're afraid that we're going to end up getting probably what we deserve, but Christ took in our place. What is it we're fearful, fearful of today? Whatever that thing is, the Bible has told us through Paul, through his teachings, we'll look at some of this today, that we are not to be consumed by the spirit of fear. That we are to be the people who uh, go forward led by the Holy Spirit, not by the spirit of fear. You begin to look at these uh, verses, and in the book of uh, Romans, the 8th chapter, I won't turn there for the sake of time uh, this evening, but it talks about uh, the adoption that God has given to us that as, uh, as a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ, we can have confidence that, yes, we're going to face very difficult circumstances in our life. And I, I can't imagine the, the, uh, the pain and the anguish uh, uh, that folks have, you know, who have lost loved ones and, and uh, who are really facing the loss of their house and, and the loss of their livelihood, and, and maybe they have to relocate. I, I can't imagine the fear or the anxiety those things would cause in your life but we're not to let those things rule. God has not given us the spirit of fear that it becomes so dominant that all of the other good things that God has promised us, uh, you know, the, the victory that comes through, uh, through the resurrection, the victory that comes through alignment with the Lord Jesus Christ, all those things, all those precious promises should help us overcome the spirit of fear. God didn't give it to you if you're under it today. So I want us to look at the thing that God did not give us, which is uh, the spirit of fear. And then I want us to look very closely at the three things he did give us. So he didn't give us a spirit of fear, it says, but he did give us a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, when we begin to think about power, that has a different role, you know, in, uh, in, in different contexts. Uh, the definition of it is the ability, the strength, the capability to take some type of action. And uh, it's been amazing as we've seen, uh, quite frankly, the, the power that's been yielded over the last uh, month or so. Uh, I mean, never seen anything like it in my life. And, and we, were, we were teasing a little bit about uh, uh, the photograph that was shared of uh, Brother Ralph. And, but, I mean, the power to close a barbershop, the, the power to tell people that you can go here and you can stay there and, and, and you can't do this and what have you. And, and it's, it's for good, you know, it's, it's to keep us from, uh, from uh, transmitting this uh, terrible disease and, and uh, just, uh, uh, you know, making things uh, uh, a thousand times worse if we didn't have that. But you think about the, pa the people who are in power, and I love what the governor's done, love our governor, love our president. Uh, yes, I did say that on, uh, you know, I think they're doing a great job. We're not through this thing yet. My biggest concern is, is, is how far are we through it? But they've yielded their power, their ability, their strength, their capabilities to try to do good for the society that's around us today. Paul understood what true power was when he gave this message to Timothy, when he gave us the gospel messages. For 30 years, he had served the Lord Jesus Christ. And during that time, yes, he had experienced shipwreck. He, he had uh, experienced, you know, being put in prison and being beaten and, and, and abused and neglected and those type things. But he'd also seen the salvation of the jailer. He had also seen the, the testimony influence the, 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 uh, the, the uh, people that were there after the shipwreck. Uh, he, had, he had seen the storms come in his life, and he had seen the power of God to address those storms. We think about that strength that Paul had in his life. And I think about how God grants us that same ability today to be more than conquerors, to be overcomers. I've always looked at that statement, and, and we apply that to the Christian life. And, you know, a conqueror is someone that comes in, and, and, and they see the problem around them, and they just, they're able to address it. They take it out. They're, they're able to eliminate it from their life. Could you imagine if someone came up uh, this coming week and said, we have absolutely found the cure for this COVID-19 thing. You, you're going to take this, uh, uh, this injection or you're going to take this tablet uh, or you're going to do you know, this, this certain treatment, whatever it is, and it's going to be gone. That's a conqueror. 
But sometimes we can't conquer the things that are in our life. And Paul addressed that. He, he, he lived uh, his life with an infirmity that he said he'd prayed to God about. God did not take it away. And sometimes we can't address those things that are a conflict to us, so we have to live through them. We have to become, uh, you know, to the point where, where God enables us to go through those. Paul had both those. He, he had situations where he was able to eliminate uh, the problem and, and, and other areas where he had to just rely upon the power of God to address the things that were in his life. The Bible talks about tremendous power that is given from God. I want you to think about the people in the Bible, such as Samson, the Bible says that when the Spirit of God came upon him, that, that he had tremendous power. I mean, you know, could you imagine? I, 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 there's nobody I know. That, I mean, literally, I know some quick people. I know some athletes, what have you. There's nobody I know that could run down a fox and catch one, <laughs> right? Samson caught a whole bunch of them and tied their tails together. This guy was quick. And it talks about he lifted the, the, uh, the gates of the city and he carried them, you know, up, up a hillside. We can't even begin to imagine the strength and that power that God gave to him. And by the way, one day in heaven, we'll meet Samson. Uh, my own opinion has always been they could never figure out where his strength came from. So I don't think he was this great big, uh, you know, giant of a guy. I think he was a, a pretty average guy. But an average guy, under the power of God, does amazing things. Amen? So we think about that physical power. And then you begin to think about the, the power of Elijah. Elijah had tremendous spiritual power to the point the Bible tells us that there was a contest one day and, and, uh, and God heard his prayer and sent down fire from heaven that it was a tremendous witness uh, so that after the consuming of, of the people and the sacrifice was done, uh, the, the, the false priest, the people began to cry out to God. They, they recognized that only God's ability uh, working through Elijah was able to do that. You think about John the Baptist and the power that John had as a forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ to come to a people who, who had waited for 400 years for a prophet to speak again. He was in a time of tremendous religion. The, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, uh, you know, the scribes, they were all around him. He came preaching the gospel message that, that uh, God is, is sending his son. That's power. And the, one, of the thing, uh, one of the things I, I love about God is that God is willing to share uh, in certain circumstances, his power with men. He empowers us that we might have service. I appreciate the pastor. He preached uh, uh, a wonderful message this morning. Uh, we got to hear that and, and uh, appreciate the, 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 the ladies who, who sang. And, and, uh, and again, I've already said the guys who are back here in the back who make all this stuff happen, they've got that power, that ability in them because God gave it to them. You're watching this broadcast this morning Somebody could see it all over the world. They could see it in Somalia. They could see it in Russia. They can see it, uh, you know, in downtown Blountville. Uh, but they can see this all over the world because of the people who have given their life to service. And God has given them that power. God also gives us power that we might have success. I think about the stories of people that have been so faithful to serve God. The opposition that they often face, that they stand up to, that they're able to overcome, as it were, and uh, the things that they do for the Lord. Now, uh, whatever you think of him, uh, I'm a big fan of a, of a guy named Tim Tebow. And a couple of years ago, I heard his uh, mother speak uh, at, at, a, uh, at a conference. And she talked about the story of her pregnancy and uh, Tim's birth and the family. And, and it went much broader into the ministry that they had. Now, think about this man, Tim Tebow, how he was a phenomenal quarterback. And how he was able to use that audience he had to put a Bible verse. And, and, and uh, there was a tremendous correlation between the Bible verse that he would have on his, uh, uh, you know, for that week and, and how many people would be looking it up online. That's success. That's using the power of God to make a difference in the life of those that are around you. And I'm so glad that God is still powerful. The same one who spoke and created this earth and set it in motion and separated the light from the dark and, and the land from the water and, and uh, created man from the dust of the earth and, and gave us breath, uh, breath through in our nostrils. He's still the one who's got power today. Now, some of us, we've got power for service. Some have got power for success. And to tell you the truth, in the world we're living around today, there are people just asking for the power to survive. 
because the, dif the, the difficulties, the, the, the grief and, and uh, you know, and the sequestering in place and, and those type things. But folks, I'm going to tell you that, that Jesus has power. And uh, I want to read a, uh, a verse to us from the book of, a, of Ephesians. Uh, in Ephesians, the, uh, fifth cha uh, the, the sixth chapter, we, uh, we began to look at uh, the power of God and uh, how it's manifest into the, uh, into the life of men. And uh, Paul knew something about not only the power of God, but the power of Satan that he dealt with in the world around us today. Easy to see sometimes why people become afraid, but not overcome by that spirit of fear. And in Ephesians, the uh, sixth chapter, uh, beginning at the 10th verse, uh, Paul encouraged the, uh, the church at Ephesus. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And look at the formula he gives for, for this. He says, but, uh, and put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And by the way, we're standing against the wiles of the devil, the wiles of this disease, the wiles of the world, uh, a world that has just went, you know, just really different from what we usually expect. Nothing is normal anymore. Paul looked at, at, at the individual believer's life and he said, look, put on the armor of God. Look at verse 12. He said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of, wick, uh, uh, rulers of darkness uh, of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Whereunto, taken to you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Paul said, if you're going to get it done, you're going to get it done through the power of God. Look to the cross of Calvary. Look to heaven. Pray to God in, in, in all sincerity and ask him to give you the power to overcome the circumstances, to become of, of great service, to become successful, to survive when that's what's needed. And God has the ability to grant that power. So Paul said, to the young Timothy, he said that, uh, hey, don't be, don't, be, uh, don't be hung up in this spirit of fear. God didn't give it to you. That's not your place. That's not where we're going to live as Christians. Sure, we, we, may, we may visit there sometimes, but let's get out of there as soon as we can. Let's go forward in faith. Paul talks about the, the, the power that God has given to not only pastors, and, uh, but, but to those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and sometimes this supernatural power to be able to, to overcome those things. One of the recent projects I've inherited, uh, and uh, by the way, as long as I have children, I'll always have projects to do. I figured that out. And uh, a long time ago, we purchased a 1993 Toyota 4Runner. And I love that old car. Uh, it's been in our family for many years. Uh, my uh, youngest son has possession of it. And uh, he's getting ready to, to um, uh, move, and, and the car needed to be repaired. And uh, what had happened is it has a hydraulic clutch on it. It's got two different parts to it. It doesn't really matter. But the clutch had stopped to work. And my project is to get it restored, you know, to, to get it operational again. So I, I uh, bought a part, and I went to uh, repair it the other day. I put the first part on it. It almost got it going. Still needs a little more work. But, you know, it made me think about the aspect of power. That car is sitting literally in a shed in a barn. It's well protected. You can start it up, and the engine runs really good. I think the air conditioning works, you know, and the windows work and all that kind of stuff. But, you see, because of the clutch is out, the power that's in the engine isn't transferred to the wheels. I wonder about how many times as a Christian we get like that with God. God has the ability to answer our prayers. He has the power to change circumstances in our life. But because we don't pray and because we don't believe and because we won't practice and because we won't take any risks that God has put in our heart, the power just doesn't get to the transmission. The clutch doesn't engage and we can't move forward from that place that we're at. We're still stuck in the barn because we cannot couple the power of God to the activity that's needed in our life. Power, it's an amazing thing. It comes from God. The second thing that God has given to us here in the book of, uh, uh, of uh, 2 Timothy, it says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love. Now, I, I like this idea of, of love, particularly in the world that's around us today. You see a lot of stories on the television now about people who are doing things that are amazing. 
Uh, this person has, uh, because they have a natural sewing ability, they've created uh, masks, you know, for EMS uh, teams and for first responders. And, and this person, because they found out their neighbor was in need and couldn't go outside, they went and mowed their yard. And, and I saw a story about a guy who, who I think he usually delivers newspapers. And he heard uh, that, that uh, some of the people that, that were on his route couldn't get out. So he told them he would go and get groceries for them. And he made these multiple trips because he was uh, not afraid. He was capable of doing that. Folks, I'm telling you that when you look up the, the, uh, the definition of love, it talks about deep affection. Now, uh, don't shoot me here. Valentine's Day is behind us. But I think in the world around us today, we use the word love too casually. I think it's an overly used word. Uh, I hear people say, I love deep dish pizza. Well, you probably do, but if you haven't had it, you know, in about six weeks and your life went on, eh, maybe the love wasn't really that, that deep. But there is a love that we ought to have. It's the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the love for our family. It's the love for the church. Uh, it's the love for the people that are around us that God has given us as our family. Uh, that ought, ought just to be, you know, just a great blessing to us. And uh, if you'll turn in your Bible to the book of uh, 1 John, the fourth chapter, I want to look at some uh, verses here that talk about this aspect of, of having this, this love, this, this deep-rooted, uh, you know, deep affection that's within us. I do think that love is one of the best emotions that the Christian should ever show. It's unfortunate, but, but people can very, uh, very easily look at the church. The church is founded upon the Word of God. The church is founded upon our belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, upon the principles that there is sin, there is repentance, uh, there is uh, consequences, there's forgiveness. And sometimes people don't like that message. And I would tell you, church, that what they do is they will say, well, uh, I'm not welcome there. Or those people don't love anybody. Uh, you know, we get, uh, uh, we get unfortunately, uh, typecast as being judgmental when it's actually the furthest thing from the truth. The church ought to epitomize love in all circumstances. But the fact of the matter is, the church is founded upon the core, the precepts of the word of God. So sometimes people will say, they don't love me because I have this issue in my life and, and it doesn't align with the word of God. But the truth is, we do love people. It's just you cannot have sin openly within the church. I hope that uh, helps you. And I want us to look at this, that God has given us a spirit of love. He gave it to Timothy, he gave it to Paul, he's given it to us. Uh, and in the book of uh, 1 John, the, uh, the fourth chapter, beginning at the seventh verse, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Very plain, very simple. Look at verse 9, it says, And this was manifested, the love of God towards us. Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to also love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us and his love is perfected in us. Hereby, look at verse 13, hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit. We could go on through here, but God gives us a, a God gives the church, he gives the born again Christian a nature that says we want to love people. I've recently had a, a, a you know, an unusual circumstance in my life. We have a, a circumstance where uh, there's someone that I have interacted with for several years. And uh, almost all of those interactions have been very negative, very negative, uh, very upsetting, I think, maybe on both sides of that. And it was over something that was simple. And I would stand here this evening, Pastor, and I would tell you that I have prayed for that individual over and over and over again. That, that person does not know Christ. And I've tried to take, you know, not only the high road, but to be what this book would, would, would have me to do. And even though it was not always uh, easy, 
I have prayed for several, several years, God, would you help me to love that person? Would you help me to have a concern for that person? And you ought to do the same. I'm not lifting up Steve today. I'm lifting up God. If God can love us when we're so unworthy, so undesirable, and we could come to him in grace, and as he said here, accept the forgiveness of God, and God could love us first, ought not we able, uh, you know, shouldn't we be able to love the people that are around us? And the circumstance with this person I knew took a turn a few weeks ago. I uh, had a chance to find them and spoke to them very pleasantly. There was something that was important to them. Uh, also, uh, it really didn't matter, I guess, in our life. And I made that choice to give them something that was important to them. It, 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 it cost us something, but it was a great reward. And yesterday, my phone rang, and uh, it was the person and pastor they were calling to do something positive for me. When we show love, the love of Christ, when we're kind, we never know where that's going to lead. Quite frankly, there are people that we run into in life that nobody may love them. That's the truth. That they feel like nobody cares about the well-being of their soul. They may know st the story of the Lord Jesus Christ and his coming to earth to, to uh, save them of their sins, but maybe they've never had a good experience at church. Just, just telling you. Maybe their family you know, is broken in some way that, that everything around them is painful. But we ought to have a deep affection in our hearts, in our lives, for those that are around us as God has had for us. In fact, Paul in one of the other epistles, and I, I won't go there for the sake of time, he talks about being committed to love, even within the marriage relationship, uh, husband and wife, about being committed to each other to the point of the example of Christ loving the church so much that he sacrificed himself for it. So if God has given us a spirit of love, we ought to exemplify that. Not when it's easy. You can love everybody when it's easy, but as much as we can, we ought to turn the other cheek. We ought to be the one who, who says, okay, we'll go with that as much as we can. You can't do that when it comes to the doctrine of the word of God. But there's a lot of stuff in life where it's just a preference. And we can choose to be the person that God's called us to be and to exercise that power, or we can choose to be, uh, you know, uh, difficult, as it were. So Paul, writing to Timothy, he says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I'm going to touch on this uh, third thing that God has given us, the sound mind. Now, I, I looked up the definition of that. I, I like to look up definitions. I, I like to understand what things uh, mean, what the you know, because sometimes we, we get these ideas in our mind and, and, and they're, they're, they're more what we're familiar with instead of what they are in being, you know, exact. The definition of a sound mind is someone who is mentally able to understand, to comprehend, and to make decisions or judgments that align with those circumstances. Now, typically when we hear the, uh, the uh, term uh, sound mind, we usually hear that in the context of a will. And it, it's a document that indicates that at the point when there was a signature applied to a piece of paper and a statement was made uh, that, uh, that, that, that they were thinking clearly, they made the judgments of their own uh, choice, these type things. Now, uh, I, I understand that, that context of the last will. Uh, sometimes I wonder if we shouldn't apply this aspect of a sound mind to other areas in life, like when we go to get a loan. Sometimes, you know, are you thinking about what this bass boat, no offense, is going to cost you? <laughs> are you really in your sound mind? I'm sorry, everybody that's uh, got a bass boat is now going to be after me. And I'm, I'm just saying that we need to stop and think about things in a sound mind in every aspect of life. We do, uh, we do uh, 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 premarital counseling, uh, you know, with uh, young couples, and it helps to, to, to get them to think, what are you going to do about a budget? What are you going to do about uh, uh, when you have a fight? Uh, you know, uh, because, you know, when you have a disagreement, I'm not talking about a fist fight, but when you have a disagreement, sound mind is important to everything. And, and Paul told Timothy, God has given us the gift of a sound mind when it comes to the things of church. Now, first of all, I'm going to tell you that I think that there's two sides to this aspect of a sound mind. There's the spiritual side, and then there's the practical side, the, the, the side in the world around us today. 
and, and we need both of those, by the way. We, we ought to be, you know, uh, uh, balanced in all we do. And, and forgive me uh, for misattributing the quote. I can't remember if it was uh, Benjamin Franklin or Thomas Jefferson, uh, but uh, I believe it was one of them that said that common sense is not so common as one might suppose. We live in a day where I think that's being lived out. You know, uh, you see unusual things, people doing unusual things. Not always the best, uh, uh, you know, judgment in those things. You don't see that rampant, but it is in the world around us today. So Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said, God has given us this, this uh, uh, you know, this sound mind. And, and we begin to apply that. And, and in the book of uh, 2 Timothy, if, if you turn just a couple of pages forward, I want you to look in the third chapter, and we're going to look at this. Uh, we, we talk about the, the spiritual side, the ability to understand the Word of God, to interpret it, to understand it, to make it actionable to the circumstances around us. And in the book of 2 Timothy, the third chapter, uh, Paul's writing, uh, verse 1, For this know uh, also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And he begins to go through a definition of what society will look like. And by the way, I would say if you took this definition and you were able to go back to uh, Genesis, the sixth chapter, and, and uh, you could get some more uh, uh, words related to the uh, generation that uh, was so upsetting to God that he destroyed it, I wonder if these words wouldn't be accurate even in that day. But these are things that are not the better part of man. These are the marks of the latter day. And uh, we get down to, to, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, 14th verse. And we, we see all of these attributes and all of this resistance to the word of God. And we come to the 14th verse and we get this exhortation from Paul to Timothy. He says, but Timothy, but, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of and knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Let me tell you, that ties in with a sound mind. A sound mind means being able to understand and, and to discern and, and to uh, uh, comprehend the things that are going on around you. And if you're a born-again Christian, you need to be looking at the days that we live and saying, how much longer does the church have upon the earth until God fulfills his promise and comes and takes the church away and this world is turned over to the Antichrist for the beginning of a seven-year period that will be like nothing the world has ever seen? We look at the world, the, the church looks at the world through the lens of the scripture, through the word of God. Why? because the prophecy will not fail. Everything that God said he would do, he has done, or he will do at some appointed time in the future. You can bank on that. That is the beginning of a sound mind. And it helps us to make decisions about the things that are in the world around us today. I think about this uh, in a spiritual application and, and also in a practical application. Now, if you were to turn back uh, to uh, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, Paul wrote to the, uh, the, the church at Corinth, and I want to look just at a verse here, but I think it ties very well in this aspect of, of a sound mind and uh, sound mind and making good decisions. But uh, in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, uh, Paul spoke about his early beginnings. Remember, there was a day when Paul, Saul of Tarsus, was not only an opposer of the church, he was a leader in the persecution of the church. And Paul spoke about those early days before he was called uh, uh, as a child of God, before he accepted the Lord Jesus. And then the Bible tells us that he spent three years studying the Scripture. What did he study? He studied what was now known about the Lord Jesus and the, the, uh, uh, the, the Pentateuch and, and the Old Testament and, and marrying those two together. And look at Paul's uh, writing about himself in, uh, in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, the 11th verse. Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to stop there with those verses, but I'm going to tell you that he came to the point 
where he was no longer a child. You take a hungry child, you put him, a, a, you put him in, a, a, you know, in a restaurant, tell them they can have anything they want, they're very likely to start with the dessert menu and a chocolate shake as opposed to anything that's nutritious. Why? Because it seems good to them. But a sound mind, good judgment, rightly dividing the circumstances, it will take them into something that's nutritious. The pastor mentioned this this morning. I think Brother Brian, I heard just a little bit of his, uh, of his uh, webcast this morning, was talking about the power of prayer. The sound mind's going to find time to pray, to seek God during these difficult circumstances, to seek those opportunities where we might be an encouragement, might be a witness that we might see the Lord Jesus Christ in our life, encouraging others' lives. So Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said, I want you to think about stirring up this gift of God which is upon you. In verse 7, God hath not given us a spirit of fear. He's not. You might live in days where you're, you, you've got something, you know, uh, we all do that, that's a concern to you, but you're not going to be dominated by that. You're going to get out of that ditch with the power of God just absolutely as fast as you can. You're going to put it behind you, and you're going to go forward. And then it talks about the three gifts that God did give us the, uh, of power, of love, and of a sound mind. And folks, I'm going to tell you as we close uh, this, this evening, to walk in the Spirit of God, to reject fear. We talk about this aspect of faith, being able to, to uh, believe in things that we can't understand. And by the way, if we could explain it, if we could uh, uh, tell God, why don't we just do this and what have you, is it really a faith? There's no record I can find in the Word of God where God ever came to uh, Joshua and explained to him exactly how Jericho was going to work out. Could you imagine that conversation? God comes and encourages him and, and uh, says, Now, Joshua, you're going to be going up against uh, basically with, with very primitive weapons, about a million people, but you're going to be going up against one of the most fortified cities in the entire world at that point huge army you know the, the, these people were were uh, uh they were fierce as it were they were well protected and they were able to defend themselves could you imagine that that conversation between joshua and god where joshua says um so how's this going to work out joshua uh, would be told well you're going to do this and, and you're going to march and and, and it's going to be quiet and then, then on the seventh day we're going to do this and i'm going to knock the walls right flat down what would Joshua's next question be? How's that possible? Sometimes when we face our fears, we just have to let God do his job. And then we could be amazed on the other side of it. Then we have the, uh, the, uh, the accounts, the stories, the reports that we share with other people. Hey, let me tell you about the time that God did this in my life. We can't walk in fear, so we walk in the power we walk in the love. We walk with a sound mind and great judgment. These are the things that God has intended for Timothy to do. As Paul told him, these are the things that God intends for us to do. Let us pray. Lord, I do thank you for the privilege to bring this simple message this evening. Lord, I do pray that it will be a blessing to our folks. And uh, Lord, it, it can be a fearful time out there. Let's, uh, let's be transparent about it. Uh, a lot of uncertainty that's out there. But God, there is no surprise with you. Everything that is going on is something that you've allowed to happen. It's something, Lord, that perhaps you've, uh, uh, you know, you bring circumstances into our individual lives that they help us to grow. We certainly understand that muscles, they only become stronger after they're exercised and after they're pushed a bit. I think that's the way it is in our Christian lives. It's so easy to just come and sit and listen and, and just go through, you know, the motions but if we're not careful, we become a weak Christian. Lord, we don't have the spirit of fear dominating our life. We've got to go out and take some risks and be, be the people you'd have us to be. Lead us in your word. Help us to find you in prayer. Lord, give us the, uh, the burden in our heart to be an encouragement to others. Bring us safely again soon into this place where we can worship you together in spirit and in truth. Lord, these things we ask in your blessed name. Amen. And thank you for joining us, and uh, we will see you again soon.